In this episode, Christian makes changes to the look of the aliens. Our enemy looks like Santa Claus a <laughs> little. And so there's only one thing he can do now. Uh, so we're gonna have to think about explosions. And so begins... Things are happening. His quest for destruction. I think it's a monster energy drink that is speaking here right now. Hi everybody, uh, welcome to Lazy Devs Academy. This is Christian and I. Uh, we are working on little shmup tutorial this episode 14. And our little shmup is proceeding well. Let me load this up, let me look what's happening. Do we have a start screen now? We can shoot, we can rapid fire. And alas, when we hit, uh, enemies, the enemies explode. When enemies hit us, we lose life. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Something I want to do today is I want to look in more into explosions. Uh, generally, this part is going to be like kind of like the fun part. This is the part where we're going to uh, focus on the thing that we call juiciness. Um, that's kind of like a term that's kind of being thrown around, you know, in game design circles. Juiciness, kind of like a very broad term describing, you know, the game feeling nice to play, feeling, you know, responsive and, and well animated, you know, little attention to details and so forth. We can maybe later on dive a little bit deeper what that means. But for now, just, you know, juiciness means like uh, I, something I want to focus on is like making, um, working on little effects uh, that make. Um, the process of hitting the enemies uh, that makes it more fun and enjoyable. So, you know, we're gonna look at some effects today. We're gonna play around with some effects uh, that create a more responsive game in general. And yes, one of those effects will be explosions. Um, now, one thing I noticed, there's a little, we have a little counter for the amount of bullets on the screen and I haven't removed that last time around. So I will do this now. Uh, I haven't been, I haven't been looking at the code for a long time, but I think it's here, right? Uh, we're, uh, we're printing the number of bullets to the screen. I will just comment this out because maybe some point in the future we want to print something else on the screen as a debug kind of thing. Now, before we start, or actually the first thing I want to do when we start is, the thing is now, right now, when we hit the enemy, the enemy immediately explodes, uh, but maybe I want some enemies to have more health. So we want to uh, maybe implement a system where enemies have health. How are we going to do this? Oh, by the way, uh, I, I have a little little display. That's a, like a, what's, what's the name of the company? Uh, oh, I think it's called Dvoom or something, like a weird name. Uh, I, I put up some of the sprites from our game up there. It's a bit blurred out at this point, but you know, no, just like to get at some more variety to the <laughs> to the experience right so uh, when we spawn an enemy uh, let's go to the place where we spawn an enemy we have this uh, function called spawn n uh, let's look at where this is spawn n it's the tab number one all the way at the bottom here we create a um, new enemy an empty enemy object and we give it some properties x y and a sprite and this is a good moment to just expand our enemy. And this is like really like the strength of like this entire idea that we have uh, objects. We can just add more properties at will when we want to expand the system. So now I'm going to say my n.hp equals five. And that's it. Enemies have HP now. Now, obviously that's not enough. We want also obviously this HP to make sense. Like when you get hit, the HP gets reduced. So it's because right now it's I okay, I have the HP, right? But it's just like it does nothing. <laughs> Enemy still dies in one hit. Uh, so now I want to uh, make sure that this HP property actually is being uh, accounted for when an enemy is hit. And for that, we need to find the place in our game where we hit an enemy. Uh, so I think there's gonna be an update function and this big, big update function all the way up, up top in uh, tab number two. Um, collision enemy and bullets. That's that's what we're looking for. So if there is a collision between an enemy and a bullet in this if statement. Previously, we just deleted the enemies and the bullets and so forth. But now we kind of want to do something else. So first of all, we definitely want to delete the bullets. So that's something I'm going to move to the top. Um, right. And then we're going to do something like um, my n, because this is the enemy that is being collided with, my n dot hp minus equal one. So we subtract one from the hp 
And then we're going to say if my n dot hp is smaller or equals zero, then, and only then we go through the motions of deleting the enemy, playing the sound effect, and so forth. So uh, we also have to add in a new end uh, um, statement here, and we also want to make sure that everything is indented properly. But yeah, something like this. Um, now, there's the problem is now when you hit an enemy, only when you actually enemy dies, we're going to hear something. So right now uh, we might not actually see a difference here, and that's what I'm getting at. Let me let me just play this and see how that works. All right, so I'm shooting. Now the enemy takes a while to to die. Okay. And so off the bat, we already have a bit of a problem. So we can shoot at the enemy, right? But it, it, it's kind of, it, it doesn't look great. It's, it's bad. It doesn't, mm. currently the enemy doesn't really respond to being hit. There is no, like if I shoot once, I mean, this shot disappears, right? So I get, I guess I get an idea that that, I sh that enemy is kind of like absorbing a hit, but I don't really feel it. I don't see it. I don't hear it. Like there is no communication to me that I, I dealt any damage. And that's something I see quite often. People you know, get, so people get collision detection going and they get the bullets going and so forth. And they're just like, that was hard, you know? Uh, it's it's like you know we're finished here and let's uh, let's just let's just get this ga game out of the door you know let's not think about making our life too complicated. But actually, this is the moment. This is the place where uh, you know the real game development begins. The real game design begins. You need to have the stamina. You need to have the uh, the willingness to to get your hands dirty because now the things are get really really fun. So there's multiple things we can do to communicate to the player that, that, there, that there was a collision. Uh, one thing we could come up with is maybe like a hit sound that is not necessarily a dying. Uh, this was, wait, this is the, you know, enemy exploded sound effect. So maybe we can have a similar sound effect that is a bit sim uh, easier. Maybe something that's, maybe just like something like a little tone. Something like this might be enough, maybe. Uh, I don't like the, I don't like this, maybe, 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 maybe like this, maybe, maybe after all like this, oh yeah, that, that, that sounds good, it sounds a little bit like the sound effect in Call of Duty when you hit people, maybe like this, okay, let's, let's, let's try this, sound effect number three, and this is like a very, as you see, sound effects are such an effective way of doing this. Uh, right, so I'm gonna play this sound effect. Yeah. Okay, so this is good. Really nice and unobtrusive little sound that kind of like communicates that, that um, damage is being dealt, and that's okay. Um, but I want to go further than that. I want to actually see a difference. Um, there's, again, there's so many different ways of doing this. Um, one thing could be, for example, to show a different sprite, to so have like an enemy that reacts to being hit. A uh, really game, good game that does that is Parodius. There's a lot of enemies in there that are just cartoon enemies, and they always have like really funny faces when it's like get hit, like oh, you know. Uh, that's 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 a fun thing to do. Uh, I think something that we can pull off that is kind of really easy is just to make the enemy flash. So let's introduce a new property to spawning enemies. So this is we um, we are back in tab number one in the spawn n n function. And we're going to add a new property called myn.flash. And we're going to set it to zero. And so the idea is that we, whenever we want the enemy to flash, uh, we set the, this flash property, this flash variable, we're going to set this to a number. And that number will count down in every frame. So in every frame, let's say we want to make the enemy flash be, appear completely white for three frames, right? We're going to set a uh, flash to three. And each frame that it appears completely white, we're going to count down this variable and, until it reaches zero. And when it reaches zero, we are showing the enemy not flashed, like normal, right? That's that's my that's my idea here. Right. So my n flash equals zero. Uh, I'm going to go in our update function. And here, when we hit the enemy, my n dot flash equals, let's set it to something really visible, like 30. 
so we really see the flashing. So it's going to be 30 frames a whole second. It will be uh, flashing a whole second. Okay, so now we just need to make sure that when we're drawing the enemy, that flashing is being taken into account. Let's go to the tab number three, to the big draw, draw game function here. And let's see where we're drawing the enemies. Ah, okay. All right, so here's where we're drawing the enemies. So uh, as we saw, there is this draw my spur function and that does kind of like this universal draw function that draws all of our sprites. Uh, for now, only the enemies are flashing. So we're just gonna write our own little code that will make them flash. And now we, you might be thinking like, where is this going? How do we make the enemy flash? How do we make it appear white? Don't we have to like create a new sprite for this or something? We're gonna do a little bit of a, bit of a trick. But for now, let's do something like this. If my n, so, you know, we're going through all of the enemies. This is a loop here, right? We are going through, in this loop, we're going through all of the enemies. And every time we go, we pick a new enemy from our list, uh, we set this helper variable my n to this this enemy that we're looking at currently. So if my n dot flash is greater than zero, then my n dot flash minus equal one. So we are counting down the flashing here, and this is a bit weird because technically this is. Um, this is something that should go maybe in the update function, right? Because we said the update function is, you know, gameplay related. This is where variables change. And here in the draw function, this is just when we draw things to the screen. But I think sometimes it's fine in the draw function, especially when it's something that is so, you know, visual, like if something flashes or not. Uh, and, you know, this has no gameplay relevance um, as well. Like it's sometimes fine to, to modify variables you know, here in the draw function, it's fine. It won't hurt us or anything. I don't, I think we can, we can, we can deal with this. Never mind about that. How are we going to actually pull off the flashing, the, the thing where the, the, where the sprite appears uh, white. So um, there is a function called pow. This is what we're doing now is called palette manipulation. With the pow statement, it's a very, very powerful statement that can do a lot of things. For now, what I wanted to do is I want to change a color. I want to replace a color in our palette with a different color. Uh, and in this case, we are, you see how our enemy is kind of like, uh, it's made out of greens. So especially this uh, uh, bright green and this dark green. Let's just say this dark green here, this color number three, it says color number three, right? I want to replace that color with color number seven, that's this white. I just want to replace them. If I execute this statement, then all of the drawing, all of the sprite drawing that happens afterwards will have the dark color green replaced with the, with the white color. It's all of the dark green stuff will appear white from now on until I reset it. How do I reset it? I can reset it right away after I draw my enemy by just going pal. I mean, I could go, you know, three, three, something like this, right? But uh, you can just call pal, open, close parentheses, that will reset everything to the default again. I'm just gonna run it to see the result. Oh yeah. And you can see how it switches back as well. It works, right? For 30 frames, our enemy looks like Santa Claus a little bit. <laughs> Bam. Okay, so this works now. Now for enemies where there is no flashing, we're just resetting everything to defaults and they, it was already default anyway, so you know makes no difference. But for, uh, for all the enemies where you know, we did some flashing, that will ensure that other enemies won't flash you know, in unison, you know. So yeah. Uh, we can also, by the way, we can just replace the, like remove this, reset everything to defaults real quick to see what happens. Not much. I mean, now everything is flashing, ba basically. Everything is white. Now everything, every enemy looks like Santa Claus now. And the reason for this is that there is just not a lot of green stuff on our screen. Like this is the only place where we're actually using this dark green color. But for example, if our uh, ship had some green in it, that would also appear white. We can just test it if that's true. Let's put, let's make our ship green for a second. You see how our ship has turned white now too? 
because every time we draw something that has green in it, that green will just have white. Okay. Let us reset this to red. Okay. Um, but you know, it's not like as it's. It looks like Santa Claus. It's not really like the entire sprite is flashing. So how do we do that? Well, I mean, a simple way of doing this is just to say like, okay. Uh, the green, the dark green color um, turns into white, but also this bright green color that is going to be 11. We're going to turn that also into white. Now we also in our sprite we have white here, but that white is kind of already white. We don't have to turn it white. And we have also this dark, dark uh, blue color that is going to be color one. And we can replace this to one seven. Bam. Let's, let's run this. Bam! And now the entire sprite is white. That's what we wanted. Now, as the next thing, I want to go to um, this uh, this if statement where we do when we do actually the collision detection. I want to lower um, this flashing duration. It's a bit too long. I think let's, let's lower it to just three frames. Let's see how that looks. Oh, that's not good. What happens? Oh, <laughs> I forgot to delete this this quotation. So yeah, we want to reset everything to default after we draw our enemy. I forgot to do that. Right. So now you can see, now that the flash is like so sudden, it feels like a lot more juicy now. It feels like, oh yeah, like it, that feels, mm, that feels so good now. Oh yes. Mwah. Perfect, perfect. I love it. Something I don't like is that we kind of have to like cherry pick the colors of the of the enemy that's flashing because what happens if at some point we're going to create a new enemy that uses different colors, right? How do we make it so that it doesn't really matter what colors we're using for the enemy, that all of them will get, uh, that, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of sprite we're using, the big enemy will flash uh, either way. There's different ways of doing this. But a very simple way is just doing little for loop, for next loop, right? We're going to go to 4i equals uh, 1 to 15 do end. And then inside we're going to have a pulse statement that goes basically i, the color i, and gets replaced with 7. So all of the colors, all of the colors are get, going to get replaced with, with white. All of the colors. We're starting with one and going all the way up to 15. Let's just check. Uh, I don't want the, the black color to get replaced with seven. Currently, the way this is set, the black color is transparent anyway, so the, like it doesn't really even matter that much. Uh, but yeah, I want to start with the color number one, that is this dark blue color, and I want to go all the way up to 15, that is this color. That's why I'm starting at one and going to 15, right? One to 15, and then inside this for next loop, uh, indented, right? We have increased the indentation here. Uh, we have the pulse statement that basically says like, yeah, the eye color gets replaced with seven. So we basically call this little pulse statement 15 times and then uh, and then replace each color by one, one by one with the white color. And we're gonna save, save this and see if this works. It works. Oh, I love it. Something you can tweak around uh, uh, is how long the flashing happens. You know, you can see what happens if we flash for 10 frames. Does that feel better? It's a little bit, a little bit laggy. It feels a bit laggy. What if it's just one frame? That's okay. That's okay. That's kind of like a bit flashy, but I, I feel it's a bit, a bit too sad. I think, oh yeah, two kind of works nice. I kind of like the, like the two. Maybe we're going to keep it at two. Let's see if three was uh, what we had before. That's okay, but I kind of like start to see a bit of a, it feels kind of like a bit too. Yeah, four is uh, four is too much to me. I think I'm gonna stay at uh, keep it at two. I think this is kind of nice. It feels nice and snappy. Okay. This is one uh, result, one effect, one one phenomenon. Okay, good. But um, as I said, like juiciness, uh, we talk about this concept of juiciness of the game being responsive. And something I like to say is that juiciness is not just one effect. It's not just like I'm going to introduce like this little animation, the juiciness animation, right? This is not just like one thing that you add. It's a lot of little details that kind of like orchestra, 
You know, it's not just like one instrument playing an awesome solo, although that's what would be it's pretty cool. It's just a whole bunch of instruments all playing the little part that contribute to this kind of feeling that is like, wow, things are happening. And so right now we have like, you know, this, you have the sound effect, we have the flashing, that's good, but we need, you know, keep layering those effects to, to create like this, this idea of juiciness. So right now, um, something I want to focus on that is kind of like very obvious. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to just spell out what I'm, I'm missing here. First of all, um, I don't like how the bullet just disappears. Um, it, it feels like it's absorbed into the enemy, so it's not too bad. Um, but I don't like how it's just like, again, as I talked about this previously, um, whenever something disappears, I kind of want to see an explanation of why it disappeared, like where it went. And the bullet is huge. And, and it just being absorbed into the enemy doesn't feel right. It feels like, like, you know, something got lost there. Like it's kind of like, feels like it blinks away. It would be nice to have like an impact effect. Uh, we're going to think about how to do that maybe in the next episode. But I think the biggest thing that we want to work on right now is when an enemy disappears. Again, same principle, something disappeared and I want to see an explanation of where it went. And it, we just don't know where it went, it just like blinks away, we don't know. There's not, there's not even like a flash, because you know, at this point when an enemy disappears, it's just not being rendered, the sprite is just gone. Uh, so we're going to have to think about explosions. Now there's myriads of ways of doing explosions. Um, let us just start with a kind of like a very, very banal way of doing explosions. Let us just make, let's just draw a sprite, just like a big sprite, and just try to make that sprite appear. Oops. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, there is a little slider here and that allows you to select of what this editing window is editing in the sprite editor. Usually, you know, the slider is all the way to the left, which means we're editing one sprite. Like, you know, just click on an enemy and you're editing one sprite. Uh, but if you move the slider to the right, you maybe already played around a little bit with this. You see that, you know, now I'm editing this whole, you know, four sprites at once. And now I'm editing, you know, uh, uh, 16 sprites uh, at once. So this allows you to kind of like um, have edit a bigger section of, of the, um, like, you know, edit more sprites at once, edit the bigger section of the sprite sheet at once and to draw bigger things. Um, so let me just draw an explosion, if a frame of the explosion. We're going to have a bright center. And uh, no, Pico 8 has the color palette is really, really limited, but it has a really nice gradient going on from you know, from uh, white to orange to red, you know, there's just like a lot of nice colors to make flames happen, to make like, you know, uh, to make it look like, like something's burning. So I kind of like really appreciate it and take advantage of this a little bit. I'm making it um, a little bit noisy, a little bit crazy because, you know, explosions are not neat. There are, explosions are things that are a little bit, you know, chaotic, so I don't want it to feel too much like a circle. I want it to be a bit chaotic. Uh, I don't want it to overthink it too much. Uh, and at the edges of the explosion, there's maybe going to be smoke. I don't know. Maybe I want to add this deep red. That often adds a bit of a cooler. I don't want add there to be more red. I don't I want to lose the red. Yeah, something like this. And you know, this is just like experimenting. I'm just like going through the experiment of what will this look like? I kind of have obviously an idea of what this will look like because I've already did it myself a lot of times. But just like, uh, this is how I would approach things if I had no idea what to do. I would just like be like, let's just draw a sprite, a huge explosion sprite, something like this, right? Uh, maybe it's a bit too square. Let's just uh, shave off the the corners yeah something like this oh by the way something i haven't even really explained is that there are these tabs up here um these uh, are basically like different pages of the spri sprite sheet the sprite sheet has four pages generally the sprite sheet is uh do we see this now generally this is the sprite this is the entire sprite sheet as you can see this is just like one big image that is, that is as big as the entire screen of pico 8. um but in order to have like this little list where you can pick uh, sprites from, um, they kind of divide it into, into four segments. Uh, 
and so you can switch to different segments by clicking on the tabs. I'm just drawing in a second seg segment here, but the, you know, I could have just drawn it here. I just like, I fe felt like it would be nice to have like this explosion in the second segment here because we might not keep this explosion around forever. Just saying. Let us just draw this huge sprite here, this huge combination of four sprites. Let's just draw it at the sp space where the enemy was when it disappears. Let's see how that works. Ha. Well, let's see. So how are we going to do this? Well, we have to create kind of like a new array. We have to create a new list, right? Because we have like a list of stars that appear in the background. We have a list of bullets. We have a list of enemies. Now we have to have a list of explosions that are on the screen. Um, generally, you know, you have to, you create like some kind of particle system for your game. Uh, this is usually called particle system, where you know all sorts of doodads and little special effects are also being drawn on the screen next to the enemies, next to the things that are relevant for gameplay. So let's let's just call this explodes. Explodes, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna start um, this empty. And then in the update function, when the enemy actually explodes, we're gonna spawn a new explode. We're gonna go local my x my x my x. We're gonna create a new empty my x, and you know it's gonna be exactly the same as for example here where we spawn an enemy. It's gonna be the same same uh, thing. I don't know. Maybe I should create. I should maybe create a function for this, right? So let's create a function for this, um, and we're gonna go function explode. Now, with the explode function is, we kind of want to say where we want to explode something, right? Um, right, we're gonna so explode, but what explode? Where explode? Where are we gonna put this explode, right? So maybe we wanna specify a position on the screen where ex an explosion should appear, right? Um, so let us give it just the uh, x and y coordinates of um, the enemy as uh, an argument. We did that before. Um, where did we do this? We did this, for example, when we did collision. We had like the arguments, but the arguments here were like objects, right? Like there were like big juicy uh, variables. I think here in this function where we explode, because maybe you want to just like spawn random explosions somewhere, right? <laughs> because something exploded. Um, so I just want to maybe take um, exp x and exp y, right? So this explosion uh, function will take uh, two uh, two arguments, uh, an x and an y uh, variable. And here when we're exploding this, we're going to say uh, my n dot x and my n dot y like this. Now I created this little thing here. I'm going to cut this out. And I'm going to go back to the tools and I'm going to paste this in here. So we're going to create this little um, explosion helper variable. And we're going to say like my x dot x, the x position of the explosion is going to be xpx. That's this variable, that's the argument. We're going to take the argument, we're going to plug it into the x position of the explosion. And my x dot y equals x y. And I, 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 there is a lot of x in here. This is a bit of a triple x with Vin Diesel kind of situation. I think it's a monster energy drink that is speaking here right now. I'm not really a fan of it. Just like to, to, be, to be clear, it's just like, it's just like the only thing that my kiosk had that had a coffee in it. Right, so we created now the explosion uh, object. We just, I just want to plug it into, I just want to plug it into um, the array of explosions. Mm, that's this one. So explodes, um, add explodes my x. We create a tiny little object that only has x and y, and we put that object into our array of explosions. So now the only thing that is left to do is to create a um, um, draw function that actually draws the explosions. Now, I'm not exactly sure in which order to draw things. I, it feels like the explosion should be drawn behind everything. Yeah, so let us just draw it after the muzzle flash. And we're gonna do something like this. We're gonna go through all of the explosions in our explode array, right? 
So we're going to do the same thing as we draw, do when we draw the bullets. Four explodes. Uh, no, wait. For, for my X in all explodes. Now we cannot actually use um, this draw my SPR function um, for one a bit of an annoying reason. This is a big sprite. Like this is a sprite that consists of four sprites. And there is a way of drawing big sprites. I haven't talked about this, how this works, but I, there's a way and I want to show this off. So uh, you know the SPR statement, right? The SPR statement. Let's just assume that we wanted to draw the top left corner of this big, big, huge hunking explosion, right? This corner. That is sprite number 64. So I'm going to put down number 64 here. We want to draw, draw sprite 64. Now we're going to take the position, the X position from my X dot X, my X dot Y. That's the position of the sprite. And now comes something new that we haven't talked about. You can add more arguments to the sprite statement. We haven't talked about this yet, but yeah, you can add now two comma two. Two, two means that we're not just drawing a single sprite. But we're actually drawing, you know, uh, a, a, like a like a clump of sprites that is two sprites in width and two sprites in height. So this allows us to draw big sprites because, you know, otherwise I would have to draw, you know, each sector of this big explosion individually, individually like this and then this and then this and then this. That would be like four sprite statements. This thing, this 2-2, two, two, allows us to draw all of these four sprites together in one chunk. And this can be useful if you want to create, you know, sprites or enemies, ships and so forth that go beyond uh, the regular eight uh, times eight sprites. So far, I've been sticking to like the little eight times eight sprites because this made, this made our collision detection a lot easier. Uh, but maybe we're going to break this out a little bit uh, later on when we're going to have a boss enemy. Let's going to see about that. For now, the explosion is huge. Uh, and so I'm going to draw two by two. By the way, I also want to mention, I haven't talked about this. Why is the explosion so huge? Um, the very important aspect of explosions that I, I see being done wrong all the time is that the explosion has to be bigger than the thing that explodes. It's a very simple rule that I feel like a lot of people making like action games don't follow. If something explodes, again, if something explodes, you know, it starts as the thing and then it explodes. Like you, you, you make this motion when you say blow your mind. Because if the explosion is smaller, basically the sprite disappears and then like a little explosion appears in its place. It doesn't feel like the thing explodes. In order for the thing to explode, the explosion has to cover the thing that disappears. Uh, it has to expand from the surface. You think of like, you know, Death Star, for example, in Star Wars, you know, you have like this ball. And then, you know, things erupt from the surface of the ball. So it has to, explosion has to, by definition, have to be bigger than the thing that explodes. It looks bad if it doesn't. Sorry for this little rant. Anyway, so we're drawing this little, and this, this huge, actually, this huge explosion at the spot where the, uh, where the enemy was. Let's see how that looks. Hmm. Okay, there's a lot of things that are wrong about this. First of all, the explosion is not quite where it's supposed to be. It feels like it's a bit offset. Uh, and also the explosion kind of is just stays there and it looks really static. It looks like it doesn't look like an explosion. It looks like it just stays there, right? Let's try to deal with that um, with the positioning first. Um, so the problem is obviously the X position, the X and Y positions, as I already said, in the top left corner of the of the sprite. Um, so um, that's where the X and Y position, that's where we put our explosion, right? But also, we that's where we also start drawing this entire huge explosion, right? That's also the top left corner of this entire thing. So in order for this to kind of feel like it's erupting from the center, from the center of the sprite, we need to move the entire explosion to the left and up a little bit. You can, you, if you look at this, the explosion appears a little bit to the to the right and to the to the like a bit too far to the right and a bit too far down for it to look as if it's exploding from the center of the enemy. So I think we need to kind of correct for that and and just add a little, you know, like minus eight. Let's see. I'm, I'm not sure if it's minus eight. Let's try minus eight. 
I think we overcorrected. Let's go with minus six. Mm, I think let's go minus four after all, maybe. Maybe minus four. Yeah. Now the explosion at least feels centered. But now the problem I have is the explosion stays along, around for too long and you know, I kind of expected this already. So here when we're exploding, I'm going to add a new property to our explosion. We're going to say, say my ex dot h. We're just going to say h. Is it, should we call it h? Maybe we should call it something like life. The life ticks down and then when it's at zero, we remove the entire explosion. Let's just keep it around for 10 frames like this. And then we are going in draw function and we're going to do kind of like the same thing that we did with a flash here, right? Where we're going to say, we're going to go through all of the explosions. We're going to draw the explosion and then we're going to go um, my x dot life minus equal one. We're going to reduce the life, the life expectancy of the, of the explosion by one. And we're going to say if my x dot life is smaller or equals zero. I'm always using smaller than equals. Um, the reason for that is like, I just want to like, again, maybe we're going to tweak around this number or something. Maybe there's going to be some kind of way in which we draw below, below zero. Well, like if it's below, below zero, then we definitely, you know, we want to, we want to uh, remove the explosion. Um, if it hits zero, that's okay. But if it's, you know, if there's for some reason it drops below zero, we, I just want to also cover that that uh, situation because if, if we don't cover that situation, then again, something might happen. It draws below zero and then the explosion would persist. Um, but yeah, and if that happens, I want to basically say delete the my x. Um, no, we want to delete this from explodes. We're going to go delete explodes my x. We just want to make the explosion disappear. Maybe that will feel more dynamic. And it's like it doesn't, it doesn't feel dynamic, right? Why doesn't it feel dynamic? And I've seen this a lot of times. A lot of people make explosions like this. I've seen explosions like this in shmups that appeared on Steam. Definitely. Well, the problem is that this is not an explosion. I mean, this is a frame from explosion, but it's not an animation. It's not an animation from explosion. Real explosions are, you know, things that move, that are animated, right? So we have to actually have multiple frames of an explosion. And this is where we're gonna kind of get into a problem here because we kind of have to, uh, you know, draw more frames of the explosion uh, to create like a f more fluid animation of, you can want to see a development here happening, all right? So let's try to animate this uh, explosion. We're going to see uh, set a budget of a couple of frames. I'm going to copy this and paste. Uh, let's say we're going to have five frames of the explosion. And this uh, frame that we have here, maybe is going to be in the center frame. That's going to be in the middle of the explosion. And I, I just want to animate this entire explosion all the way through with, with five frames. So we're going to see how this works. You know, this is already a huge chunk just for, for the one explosion. We're going to see how that works. Uh, and this is also allows us to think about, I mean, I've been looking a lot of, at a lot of explosions in, in the internet to kind of like research this. Um, and also another good way is to look at just like other video games, because I feel like real explosions are not quite, uh, don't quite look as like the explosions that we are kind of like used to. I feel like when, uh, when we think of explosions uh, as like, you know, uh, kind of like the kind of audience that grew up with, you know, with video games and in Hollywood movies. I feel like when we think of explosions, we think of things that are, you know, like this crazy fireball effect, you know, that are more like, you know, combustion things and not necessarily how, you know, how real explode. Like if you look at explosions, like from war footage or something like this, or from like, you know, safe detonations, like from Mythbusters also, like it's a good source for explosions. <laughs> you see that, you know, real explosions are just very sudden and there's a lot of smoke, but not a lot of fire usually. Um, that's because like in, in Hollywood uh, movies, you usually use, um, you know, when they explode things, you, they usually add just a lot of fuel to the explosion to make it seem more, uh, 
to, to kind of like emphasize the, the fire, the hotness of it, and, and less the, the force that is happening with the explosion. And, you know, this is where you get like, you have to do some research yourself and find out, you know, what, what's, what looks good and don't, don't, doesn't look good. I'm not, I'm not going to claim I'm like some kind of expert on this. Um, but yeah, usually you have like a white, you want to see something that is very white and blinding as, as your first frame because you, you know, this is where the, where the energy is getting released and that energy is like hot white. It usually, when it is the camera that films this, it surprises the camera because it's like, you know, crazy white. Uh, uh, another good source to look at is like anime, like animated movies especially Japanese animated movies, because there's like a lot of different techniques of how they solve explosions and how they convey this idea that something is bright. Uh, quite often, they, for example, they make the actual, the entire background darker to make it like appear even brighter. There's different uh, effects that you can pull off. And it's, you know, it's going to be up to you what you want. And then I want to have like this initial ex expansion here, maybe. Uh, and I want to focus. Um, I, I want to focus on the color uh, as well. I want to go from like very very bright to, uh, over to very yellow. Like I, I don't want to. Um, initially, I, maybe I don't even want to show the red at all. I just want to see like uh, in the second frame. I maybe just want to see like huge uh, meatball of. Uh, of yellow and maybe a little bit orange, you know, I just want to make it seem it really bright. Something like this. Uh, and you can click through a little bit to see kind of like how it, how it animates. Right, we said this is going to be our middle frame. And this is where the explosion kind of dies down a little bit. So now we kind of have to, like now the smoke takes over. Now that this is the part that is, you, you have like this billowing smoke that is kind of like stifling the explosion a little bit. And now we no longer have like this bright fire anymore and more, everything is more reddish tones. And maybe a little bit of the orange still. Uh, but generally like it's the smoke and maybe like these um, you're gonna bring in the purples here to kind of like to To have this idea that there's maybe like the fire is still behind the smoke somewhere But now the smoke is kind of like slowly covering the fire everywhere and I want to also um, Evolve the edges of the explosion so like from one frame to another you kind of actually see some movement So it because right now if you see that some pixels don't move at all and if something's not moving at the explosion It looks really really wrong so you kind of want to make sure that every pixel was at least touched once. Uh, I also want to make sure that it's not, because right now we're drawing a square, so it's very easy to draw a square explosion. Uh, and I want to make sure that the corners are kind of like staying free. So we kind of have like a, uh, a roundish explosion. I want to make sure that uh, when I click between the different frames, that there's movement everywhere. And whenever something is static, I want to do some change there. Yeah, here's something static. This is definitely static up there. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to maybe add more, um, f like a little frizzly outline here. And maybe even more reds and, and, and more of the purples. And then the final frame is just going to be, you know, the final puffs of the explosion, like uh, the leftovers. Uh, we're going to see, you know, we're not going to see any fire anymore. It's really just going to be gray. And and uh, we, I'm uh, here with the slider, you can change the size of your brush. And I'm going to use a bigger brush a little bit because I want to have like more, you know, puffs. Uh, and I'm going to make sure that Again, there's movement between this frame and this frame because this is the one that we, that we based everything on. Something like this. All right. So it's kind of difficult to preview this animation here. You have to kind of click through. I'm, I'm not sure if there's a way of in, in PQA to do this, but yeah, now we have like the sequence of, of, um, of integral frames and we, we want to show the sequence over the course of the actual explosion. Right, so let's do that. Now, um, 
I'm gonna maybe change things a little bit. I'm gonna actually make here, uh, I'm gonna change this, change this life property. I'm gonna actually change this into age. And you will see why in a second here. And I'm gonna start age at one. Um, and then here in the draw function, when we're actually drawing the explosion, instead of reducing the life by one, I'm gonna increase the age plus equal one. We're gonna increase the age. And so for now, I'm gonna have, make it so that an explosion lasts for exactly five frames, starting with the frame number one. So it's like one, two, three, four, five. And if the age is greater, greater than uh, five, uh, then we delete the explosion. So basically the age is also the frame of the explosion, right? So one, two, three, four, five, and then the explosion disappears. Um, now we kind of have to figure out how to get the, the frame of the explosion. And you know, for this, you can just do, uh, I'm gonna create a little, little, little helper variable. I'm gonna create local uh, X frames. I'm gonna call this X explosion frames. And I'm gonna create a little table of the individual frames. So uh, 64 is the first frame. That's the first sprite that we're drawing. Uh, always the top left corner of the sprite. And then 66 is the next one. Then uh, 68 is the next one. Then 70 is the next one. And then the last one is 72. So now we have like a little array that, um, or like a little list of the numbers of the sprites of the individual frames that we're gonna show uh, and now here, when we're drawing the sprite, we can just plug in X frames, square brackets, uh, and then we're gonna pull the number from the age. Let's just see how that works. Huh. Okay. Now the explosion is a bit sudden. Now the explosion is a bit sudden. It is it's very, very, uh, it disappears very quickly. Something you can do here, for example, is instead of the five, we're gonna actually use the number of X frames because it's five, right? One, two, three, four, five. It's just how many frames in our animation has. And we can um, just modify the animation by just duplicate numbers. So we have just add another frame in this list, right? And we have 64, 64. So we're gonna keep this first frame on the screen for two frames. That's why we have 64, 64. So the, the first two entries of the animation are gonna be uh, this sprite here. So it's basically corresponding to this big, big, big frame. Let's see how that works. Yeah, that's a little better. Uh, and maybe we can duplicate, you know, the, the final frame also a little bit. And maybe this frame, I just maybe just we slow down the entire animation. Okay. Now we can also maybe something we can also do is here when we um, we do the age, we're gonna add plus five instead of one, uh, plus zero point five instead of one. So um, the, the explosion is aging slow. Mm, that doesn't quite work. Mm. I'm not even sure why it's not working, to be honest. Why it doesn't work? I'm guessing um, using comma values to, to address an, an array doesn't quite work that well. Something we can do here is we're gonna, we can put this in floor and you can already see like, oh, this sprite statement is getting really busy. There's like, you know, array and then square brackets and then floor, the floor function that strips off the, the um, times behind the things, things behind the comma value. Then object and that object's property, you know, it's like, we're putting a lot of things in the sprite and in the sprite um, call, and it might be a good idea to maybe, you know, spell this out a little bit um, to make it more better readable. Uh, I'm gonna just just see if this works. Okay, it works. So maybe now we're gonna actually uh, s s spread this apart a little bit so we can see what's happening. So we're gonna do a little helper variable. Now we're gonna call this SPR uh, or my sprite. So this is just the sprite of this explosion, right? And this is gonna be, uh, uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna get, we're gonna get the age. And we're gonna go 
my SPR equals um, floor my SPR. We're gonna remove the the stuff behind the comma, and then we're gonna go um, my SPR equals X frames. X frames. This is the this is the little table that we have that in, that has the individual frames of our animation. Uh, my SPR. And then we can plug this into this. So we can see like the individual steps. So it's maybe a little bit clearer what's happening. First, we're getting the age, then we're flooring it, and then we're using this uh, to address um, you know individual entries in our uh, in our table. And then with the result is the thing that we're gonna plug into the sprite function. So you can see this looks. This is more. This this uh, is more permanent. It's not quite as sudden, but it looks choppy. That's the problem. We slowed down the animation, but now because you know certain frames are being held on the screen for a long time, it it looks kind of less fluent. It looks kind of like. Uh, I'm gonna br uh, bring up the speed again. So this is more sudden, but it looks more flow fluent. And this is kind of generally a problem that you have with animations. Whenever you want to have a fluent, uh, kind of like really nice and fluent animation, you want to have more frames. And that means you have to draw more, like we have to spend more, like we want to add more frames to this animation, we have to spend more time drawing those frames. And also, it means that we are using a lot more space for of our sprite sheet um, just for this animation. And what if we want to have a second animation, right? Because you know all the animations now will also look the same. Um, this is not an ideal situation. This is not an ideal situation. And this is why on the next episode, I want to actually address maybe this situation and I want to maybe create uh, explosions procedurally. This is the point where we are moving on to the doggy zone. That's right, the doggy zone. So I have three challenges for today. One of the things that we talked about today is how to um, uh, do, where is it? Here, how to do palette swapping. So a cool way of experimenting with this is for example, when we spawn enemies right here, you know this from other games, you know, a very easy and cheap way of getting like more variation with your enemies is to have color swapped, like palette swapped enemies. So instead of like the, the just a green enemy, you have a blue enemy and a, you know orange enemy and so forth. So I want you to try to pull off the color swapping. So different, um, like depending on, it's just differently colored enemies appear on the screen using this pulse statement and not by creating any more any more uh, sprites. That's quest number one, challenge number one. Challenge number two, kind of like very straightforward, is um, just applying this uh, this flashing that we had here, this flashing uh, code that we have here, and we draw the enemies. I want to apply this to when the player gets hit. So when the player ship gets hit, I want that ship to flash. And finally, I we talked about, again, we're gonna come to that later on, but we talked about how um, it's kind of sad when a bullet is, um, uh, when a bullet hits the enemy that it kind of disappears. Um, it would be nice if there was a small explosion happening that that, would, that kind of shows the bullet uh, dissipating. So add that in any kind of way uh, you you can think of. You could do kind of like an animation, like a little circle going out, like uh, we did with uh, the muzzle flash, um, but it would kind of procedurally generate it. Or you could try your hand on uh, on an explosion like this uh, that we had here, uh, but maybe of a smaller scale, just like to have like this effect of bullets dissipating after they hit an enemy. Okay, now, this is gonna be it. Sorry for this longer episode this time around. This is a, it's a big topic, obviously. Uh, yeah, this is the point where I also wanted to quickly point out the coffee and the beautiful people at Coffee who made this episode possible. That's right, this video series has been made possible through the generous support of my viewers on Coffee. Thank you so much. And if you aren't a supporter yet, check out coffee.com slash lazy devs. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for watching. And so in our next episode, as I already said, we're gonna dig into procedural explosions. And I think this is gonna be really fun. We're gonna get some uh, particles going and, and you know see how particles work and so forth. This is the part where you know I'm really having a lot of fun. That's why these episodes are getting a bit longer. But I hope this is worth it. See you guys next time around. Bye bye.